hosted by Tony Gapperstone. Thanks for tuning in. It's showtime. Showtime. Hey, everybody. Episode 232. 232 of Brave Maker Podcast. My name is Tony Gapperstone. I am a writer, director, actor living in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. Specifically, I'm in Redwood City today, which is where our studio is. I am a Caucasian man wearing a brown beanie and yellow glasses today with a pink word of Brave Maker behind me in a faux green space with striped wall. We like to be inclusive with our introductions because we want everybody to be connected to the things that we're doing here. You can find out more about what we do at bravemaker.com. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that thrives and depends on the generosity of our patrons and donors. So if you are one of those people, please consider becoming a donor so we can continue to do this show not only do our show but do our film festival which is in its sixth year here in redwood city july 11th through 14. you can find me on all the social medias at my name tony gapastone or my own personal website is tonygap.com if you want to see some of my acting directing screenwriting producing work I would also love to work with you. If you are an actor, we do acting classes here at the Brave Maker Studio. The next one starts April 17th. It's a six week course called the Brave Maker Academy where actors learn by actually making films. And then I also teach screenwriting on Zoom as well. If you have a story you wanna tell, you should go to bravemaker.com and sign up for our Zoom class that starts on April 25th, 2024. All right, that's everything at bravemaker.com. Again, thanks for tuning in episode 232, where we talk to creators, to people who are making stuff all over the world. But today it's really cool that we can talk to somebody who's in the Bay. Uh, this person is uh, self-identified as a recovering academic, a professor, a mom, uh, a creative uh, musician, a producer of film documentary. We're gonna talk about it all today. Very excited to welcome Tiffany Marie of Artilia Green. Welcome, Tiffany. You want to go ahead and introduce yourself, Tiffany? What's going on, everybody? I'm Tiffany Marie of the band Artelia Green uh, from San Francisco, California. But I'm reporting live from Oakland, East Oakland to be exact. Glad to be here with you all today. You said reporting live. I love it. We are live. We are live. So if you're watching live on our YouTube channel, Brave Maker Org, or x or facebook we're really glad that you're here feel free to put stuff in the in the chat questions comments but uh yes please go follow artelia green music on instagram so tiffany tell us a little bit about how you got your start off pod before we started the live show you were saying you have a studio in epa you live in oakland you just had a show in menlo park yeah how did this whole journey start for you creating of creating or being a part of Artelia Green, because that's a huge difference. <laughs> Let's hear creating first. I'm assuming the creating stuff happened first, and then Artelia Green happened somewhere in there. For sure. Yeah, I mean, my mom told me I was clapping in church as early as like three months old. And so, you know, loving music and being a part of music production, I think, has been uh, here for a while. I, um, I've been doing music and in music and bands most of my life, concert bands. And um, and then as an educator and a critical educator, I try to be as creative as possible. And so, I mean, as early as I can remember, I've been doing this work. And uh, Artelia Green came around really very recently, actually in 2019, mm -hmm. where we had, uh, there was an idea for a band. I've always wanted my own band. Um, and then the pandemic hit, which, mm -hmm. I thought it was an amazing time for creatives um, because we all got to slow down and we were home a lot. We had a lot of time and energy to really engage. Um, and it was during that time where we actually, uh, as a band, and we just had been together for under a year, did an experimental album at 25th Street Recording. We did it live and uh, have been going on hard since then. So from looking at some of your stuff too, if you are watching live on the replay, again, I'm showing some clips and some of the music videos from our Tilia Green music on Instagram. You definitely have a creative vibe and there's some stuff that 
it seems like you're one you're definitely having a lot of fun and, and playing and uh the the music that i also listen to has some it's grooving it's moving you also talk about in your bio that you see your music as healing for your community can you talk a little bit about that and the use of your music or the purpose that you create behind the music for sure i think um before we even kind of get to the music there's the message right that, that manifests in the music and a lot of that messaging comes from my lived experience as a black person as a queer person as a poor person um, from the san francisco bay area um, i was born in baby hunters point and eventually taught there as well and so experiencing injustice experiencing gentrification experiencing uh, various forms of state sanctioned violence all of those things inform the messages that I both wanted to bring to my young people as an educator, to my graduate and undergraduate students as a professor. Um, and it made the most sense for that to also transcend into our music. What you see right there is a GC Funk video, and that's actually my mom in the center. Hmm. And then those are my two best friends, uh, those are our parents as well, their parents. And they're reenacting um, the three men that are typically in. Uh, do the right thing, Spike Lee's do the right thing, um, who were on the corner talking a lot of trash. So we wanted to, to re-envision that. But um, the the so much of what I experienced in my work as an educator and a, and a researcher really was around how do we heal from what we call toxic stress, right? The stressors that we experience as a result of some of those injustices that I named earlier. And what I was able to find in my research uh, my doctoral research was really grounded in there were three particular facets or areas that quite literally led to improved health and well-being. At the time, I was studying a biomarker of health called telomeres, which are kind of um, a great measurement of accelerated stress on our bodies. And they're, they're kind of um, they're like the caps on the end of our cells. Right. So they protect our bodies. And over time, they're naturally supposed to diminish through aging and through stress. And we were finding that we had teenagers who had the physiological makeup of folks who were triple their age, mm. who were breast cancer survivors. Um, and so we were understanding the impacts of toxic stress, but we were trying to figure out how do we buffer that? How do we resist that? How do we attenuate that? And what we found in, our, in my research um, was that consciousness, right, the ongoing, um, development of our critical thinking and the way in which we understand our positionalities in the world, culture, the ways in which we connect to our indigenous cultures, and community, the love that we have constantly around us. Those three C's, what we were finding with the young people was leading to the growth, the regrowth of their, uh, the protection on their bodies. And so what a better way to transcend those research findings and to put it into music, to be able to disseminate that through a medium that you sub subconsciously can receive, right? A medium that you can be grooving to and healing um, all in one. And so most of what I was naming for you was present both in, uh, in most of my music, but definitely in Ghetto Children Funk, which is about, it's centered around a figure that I grew up with uh, named the Bellman, who was this, this archetype uh, in, in Bayview that we knew across three different generations, but no one really knew him. We saw him. And when I saw him as a young child, he was this guy pushing a, a cart. And that's what we have um, displayed here. And when I started to do research before uh, producing this, this um, music video, I found out he was actually an educator uh, and a community activist and a critical educator who I'm guessing through displacement um, was unhoused and experienced so much of what many people from Baby Hunters Point experience. And so GC Funk was written to, uh, as a way to acknowledge those stressors, but also to reimagine re what his life could have been like um, if he were given the, the opportunities that I was understanding about what my young people were experiencing, the culture, the consciousness, right? These ongoing healing modalities. And so you see a reimagining of his life uh, toward the second half of that video so the three uh, boys that play him are really the same person growing up. And we're kind of imagining him being able to live up to the educator that he was attempting to be, to be able to mentor 
a lot of times what we see in this work is we lose our elders. We don't even have access to elders a lot of times because of the state sanctioned violence that I was just naming. Profound. This, that, this truly, truly is art intertwined with, I mean, psychology sounds like reductive, but healing and intersectional, as you're yeah, saying, sure. work, it's really deep. I, I just applaud you for, for doing this and for taking, you know, music and visuals and your own life experience and speaking it into your community, into the black community, which we know has been so marginalized and oppressed and taking it and redeeming it. It's really, really cool and beautiful. And I want to just say thank you for doing it. It's inspiring to me, even just looking at some of the images and listening to your music. And I, you know, I, I was thinking of myself, our, our, our city is doing a big Juneteenth, uh, actually the whole month of June, they're going to be doing really cool art exhibits and film screenings and music. And I was like, we got to get you to this, team thing in redwood city so i'm just shouting it out right now it's i think you know you being there and sharing this music video and celebrating some of these people that you're working with i think would be awesome so let's talk about that definitely so talk about your so you're so you're you're, you're a professor you're a musician you're also now a filmmaker you have this documentary called Ch the children could fly about the music of Artelia Green and the Bananas. Can you talk a little bit about like the research and kind of what the documentary is? Because as a filmmaker who runs a film festival, I'm very curious. <laughs> uh, you, you might even see uh, an application from me from one of our new documentaries. Okay, so. okay. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so the, the Children Could Fly is, is actually um, grounded in some of the research that I was just naming. And so it follows a four year um, longitudinal study with our young people looking particularly at the impact of critical pedagogy on their health from uh, um, using these biomarkers of health that I named um, initially. And so much of what we were doing in our time with them um, was connecting them back to African ancestral ways of being, for other young people, their indigenous ways of being. Um, we changed the framework of schooling and we had intergenerational models of education they would go teach third graders, third graders would teach them. Um, we traveled extensively um, to be able to make sense of other frameworks and models that were really focused on health and well being. Their freshman year, we took them to Otra or New Zealand, as some people call it, wow. to study the, the practices of the Maori um, and their process of language reacquisition and language revitalization. And so the, the documentary is following our first year of that work and it, it it presents the science in a pretty grounded way but so much of what the you know and artillery green uh, our, our music for artillery green is, is the soundtrack of that um, documentary but it also was a fundamental role played a fundamental role in my pedagogy as well and so so much of what i was learning in my own um, education in my treks and journeys to west africa to reclaim my own indigeneity I was bringing back those practices um, to young people. They're learning in um, tree languages. They're learning Yoruba um, and singing, right? And drumming and such. And so there was a powerful fusion of that. And the documentary, The Children Could Fly, is, is centered around um, kind of what is called folklore, but that's really Western and white supremacy's way of kind of denying our indigeneity. It was called myth of the belief that Africans could fly. And so there are children's stories. Um, and there's one particular that talks about this lineage of people being able to literally fly. And the children's book is called The People Could Fly. And so we see our young people being able to transcend the confines of settler colonialism, to be able to transcend state sanctioned violence as its own form of flying. And um, so we, we, you know, name the documentary The Children Could so when is it going to be completed and out in the world? So the, the documentary is, it's been completed. We've oh. workshopped it and it's been accepted into to a number of film festivals. We have not publicly released it yet because um, we want to be really strategic about that so that it gets in the right hands. 
Um, but it is it we've been in post production for it's been done for over a year now. But you know, in the film uh, festival circuit, you can't release that until yeah. um, until you know you're done with that. Okay, well, let's talk about this. This is interesting. There's some maybe some connection that we could do here with Brave Maker, and like I said, even the Juneteenth uh, event. If you wanted to do a premiere in Redwood City, we could certainly talk about that. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, so I also need to know what is the meaning behind the name of the band, Artelia Green. Oh, it's the best question you could ask me. Artelia Yay, Green. Good. Um, Artelia Green is named after my great grandmother. Oh, cool. Um, and that, so, that chills. That makes me feel so good. That's so cool. Oh yeah. She's a very she's a tiny woman. She was probably, she wasn't five feet. Um, mm -hmm. And she was a really, really powerful woman born, you know, into sharecropping and, and both sides of my family are from Arkansas. Um, and what I would learn about her, like when she was alive, I experienced a little bit of her up until about 11. She died when I was 11 or 12. I didn't really know her that well, but I began to know her more um, after she passed through uh, stories from my mom and my grandmother. And I just became fascinated with the idea of, that I learned that she would just leave mm -hmm. for periods of time, sometimes months. And just the idea of a woman a black woman in the 20s just leaving all you know certain responsibilities and exploring and connecting with the natural world was incredibly inspiring for me um and i had so much more curiosity so the more and more research that i began to do on my great grandmother i just learned so much about our family trauma our family resilience and so so much of what i learned about her shows up in in uh my music and it's a way to kind of honor my southern roots yeah but when we perform live we go by artelia green and the bandanas because she's known also for her her famous bandanas that she would wear <laughs> well grandma would be proud uh if you're listening to this podcast episode 232 with tiffany marie of artelia green and the bandanas on the website which you could find at arteliagreen.com you would see this it's you are a wordsmith or whoever's right i'm assuming it's you writing you are a wordsmith the words it's there's it's beautiful it is it's inspiring it's making me want to like level up my my writing very beautiful but just little things like uh, i'm reading this right from the website remember your ancestors empathize with your elders smile with your descendants artelia green braids together frisco swagger arkansas roots and yoruba remembrances to curate critical thought and action oh my gosh green merges reverberating funk and gospel vamping with brass and a djembe as a way to invite listeners to embrace the truth of black suffering and transcendence to craft more accountable and responsive relationships with our necessary grief en route to a different time space and place dang if that doesn't motivate you to want to know more about this music or be playing it in your house or in your car or watch the music videos i don't know what uh seriously re really well done and kudos and all the music videos your creative team uh you can tell has an artistic eye you can follow more information or watch all these videos on their youtube page as well and we'll we'll link it here uh so what so you're, you're a documentary uh fil filmmaker now you're you're a musician you're doing all these things what's the, the ultimate dream here what's kind of the, the goal is it do more of this stuff do bigger stuff what's kind of on the horizon for you tiffany yeah all, every everything that we offer in each iteration um is really to offer medicine as much as we can mm -hmm. and as often as we can and, and that just comes through different iterations, whether it's through our live music, it's through our documentaries, through the teaching. We have a podcast. Um, it's just different mediums for people to be able to access the medicine. And I appreciate you reading that description and that everyone will access medicine differently. Some people, right, take stuff from the earth and put it to lip. Some people go to Walgreens and the pharmacy to get what they need. Yeah. Some people go, right? And so each of us have our own sweet spot in terms of what 
lens our listening ear toward what it is that we need to heal and, and, and to transcend. And so each of those really is just about being able to offer different pathways toward a return to home, so to speak. Yeah. Quick question. Have you heard of a group called Sacred Roots in Oakland? Is I haven't. That- Okay, I'm gonna, I need to connect you with them. I worked with them about a month ago. It's a group of indigenous and BIPOC women, nice. uh, many queer, uh, who are doing indigenous medicinal work in Oakland. And I think you would definitely gel with them. So I'm going to connect you with Lydia and some other people in email after we are talking, done talking today. You definitely need nice. to chat. Yeah, and that. can you talk to me just about practical business and art because i'm an artist and it's today to be you know like so so transparent when you were talking about the cells right and the trauma we experience i am going through just the the and i i know i use this this word is a heavy word and it's triggering but it is true there's a trauma to creativity sometimes Mm. when it comes to just the thinking about i have to make a living I have to pay the bills and I am month to month and I have three kids and I have one that's going to college soon. And sometimes I'm like constantly in my earbuds listening to calming and meditative music just because I feel my body at this level of anxiety where my heart is beating. And it's always around, oh my gosh, I'm looking at my bank account going, I have to, how am I going to pay the bills? And I want to do the art, but I have to find a way also to make a living. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because we have a lot of people out listening that that's their dream too, is how to make a living doing what they love to do and creative stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's the curse of capitalism, right? Mm-hmm. And in most of our art, and I think most people's art is intimately connected to their calling. And prior to colonization, it wasn't connected to a living or making a living. It was the ability to be able to do what we're called to do to be able to sustain our people, right? And through conquest and through this very fast paced capitalism so much of how we think about why we're here so much of how we even a friend of mine uh reminded us last week so much of even what we try to manifest is grounded in labor and and being a part of and being successful in a capitalist system and this may sound really privileged but the only way out uh in my understanding and my practice is actually through opposing the participation as much as possible, which seems so weird. Some people are like, what? (laughs) Um, But part of the remembering that we attempt to do in our music and our practice, and and don't get me wrong, this is easier said than done, because if I miss one paycheck, uh, it's it's hard, it's hard. But part of the overall goal, you said to what end really is about remembering these ways of sustainability that our ancestors have left for us through various forms of love. And part of that, why I love and acknowledge that my family's from Arkansas, both sides, is when I go or when I've gone, I just went to bury my Uncle Lewis. I'm reminded that they grow their own food, right? When I go there, I'm reminded my Uncle Lewis built his own house. I'm reminded of the tools of sustainability that often get disregarded in the name of success and, and civilization or whatever other terms we want to use. And, uh, I, my goal is never, and, th- and this is not to knock anyone else, my goal is never to make a living out of my calling. I think that's where it gets really tricky. My goal is to be able to try to be as sustainable as possible so that I can protect my music and my art, to be able to do that so it's not compromised by the act of trying to live and survive. And that's a really tricky endeavor. But I do like to disentangle the two because I think it gets really complicated after that, where if you get a check for what you're called to do, you get a check for this thing, then some, uh, I'm not gonna say sometimes, a lot of times, right? The agenda gets set. A lot of times that shifts because you need that to eat and live. Um, whereas I like to protect this gift. We say a lot of wonky, weird things uh, with our music because we still can. We can offer messages that are particularly about healing in just that um, because it's protected in that regard. And so for folks who, are, who maybe are trying to sustain themselves and do their art um, and not sustain themselves through their art necessarily, um, it's really to me about a return to our indigeneity, a return to remembering the ways of being 
that provide collective sustainability. I'm going to have to marinate on that for quite a bit. So I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I hear what you're saying and I go, there is like a utopic kind of dream when it comes to that. Like if we really don't have to, cause the, the, the word and I'm, I'm with you, I think semantics and wordsmithing is so important. Like when we say certain things, it can communicate sometimes the wrong things or have it a wrong impact on us. And I, so I appreciate what you're saying and I'm trying to wrap my mind around a little bit around the, like when we get to do what we love and not connect it to the striving or the, you know, the capitalism, I think is a, is a challenge. I think because people I know I'm wondering and listening, oh, okay, but how do you pay your bills? Or how do you, how do you do that? Right. You have, I just was looking at your thing that said, love ain't paid no rent, you know, and those are some real things, right? Like how, and especially I'm wondering about this. How do you handle from a business perspective yeah. people? I'm sure. Cause even I just said, you should come to Redwood city, right? And, and share your stuff. How do you handle, um, billing or valuing the creativity or the work that you do? What are some practical tips for those people out there, uh, to know, like, how do they find paychecks, right? How do they get paid? when they're asked to show up to parties or play at clubs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it doesn't seem that hard to me. I see it, it feels like it's grounded in, um, boundaries really in that as a young artist and activist, I would say yes to absolutely everything because I felt like that was a part of the hegemony of what it means to be a social justice activist in the Bay area. And we, many of us who are older now, I'm 40, we know that that leads to burnout um and poverty but that's not to say that i am also you know charging an arm and a leg when i show up to places i think first and foremost which maybe also sounds really romantic is to be able to ground yourself in the calling in the in your purpose and so the gigs that we get uh they find us and i'm feel very blessed in that regard we're not out searching for and we've had some really impressive powerful gigs um, but the gigs that we have they find us and we try to ensure that every single time we are on a stage every single time we show up to a space that we're putting it all out there and it tends to pay for itself i'm not saying that's everybody's reality i feel very blessed in that regard um but when we're you know we perform as a 12-piece band mm. and it's really it's a really powerful function in my opinion because a lot of people eat off of yeah. those checks. But I think it also provides for such a really powerful experience as well. So we put out numbers, you know, we'll, we'll be at Oakland Museum um, in August. We put out numbers and we let folks know this is what will feel good. This yeah. is what makes sense for our <laughs> audience. And we see what they, what they have. And it's been really powerful That's because cool. I, I think we've only had to turn down maybe one or two gigs in the past few years, but it's really centered around everybody being able to be taken care of. Tiffany Murray, thank you so much for that wisdom and that knowledge and dropping it us on us here at the Brave Maker podcast. Is there anything else, you know, you want people to know about in regards to your music, or this film, or just in general, your life and you know, living out your purpose creatively? Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm actually co-CEO of a powerful record label called Red Tone Records. And we're out of East Palo Alto doing powerful work that's grounded in healing. There's amazing artists. I know people are hyped on Beyonce right now coming to country, but you should check out Miko Marks, who's one of our really powerful Americana artists. We have Effie Zilch, who's a powerful artist. We have Kiazi Malonga, who's an amazing um, Congolese drummer and artist. We have um, Soji, who's one of our artists, who's uh, one of Fela's former guitar players. We have some really powerful stuff coming out of East Palo Alto. I think folks should check us out. So I'm, I'm part of a much larger collective of amazing artists who are grounded in healing and transformation for our communities. Heck yeah, I love it. And if you know Brave Maker, we are in Redwood City. We're just a little hop, skip and a jump from EPA and there is so much creativity there and it often is under the radar and so i love hearing that thank you for drawing attention and spotlighting these creative people and 
find them. I love that you said that the the work or the the people find you, right? You're not having to go out and scavenge and promote. It's like they're coming to you. So I hope more of that uh, is in your future and more of those artists that you are working with yeah. are, are found as well. So uh, to go fo follow Artelia Green Music on Instagram. If you're listening to this after our live conversation in the podcast apps you can check the show notes for all this information all right everybody do not go away it's that time where we'll give you our favorite thing of the week brave faves tv shows films books songs technology clothing podcast food and more these are a few of our favorite people places and things brave faves Okay, my favorite thing of the week is going to weirdly be season five of a show that I did not watch seasons one through four of because you don't have to. It's an anthology show uh, on FX that I'm watching it on Hulu. Uh, and that is the show called Fargo. Uh, it is a adapted uh, show from the movie uh, that was uh, about a decade or more ago. And it is a kind of a crime a mystery uh, thriller, weird. Uh, it's very cool and different and fun, and I am loving it. It has some kind of slow burn type of moments. It stars Juno Temple. Some of you might remember her from uh, Ted Lasso, the soccer show on Apple. But yeah, I just found myself really digging it. It's weird. The cinematography is really cool. Uh, the characters are super unique, and I don't know, it's just inspiring me. And there's like, a, a, it's a great. I think diverse cast as well. So check out acting is really good. That's my brave fave for the week. What do you got, Tiffany? Oh man, does it need to be a show? No, anything. Good person, be food, be anything. My, my great. What is the term? Favorite. Brave thing? fave. Brave fave. <laughs> oh my brave fave. My brave fave is my 19 month old daughter, Cashmere. Oh, oh you're. Nice. Definitely a, a toddler this week and is wrecking things and saying new words. And it just reminds me to embrace every day and be present in the moment. She's my Love favorite. It. That's your favorite. Yeah, good. I am all for parenting and I love that age. I have 13, 15, 17. I love that age too. Those little ones. Oh my God. Although I'm sure you're tired and exhausted. That's amazing. Congratulations, Tiffany. <laughs> All right. Do not go away, Tiffany. To everybody else out there, I say thank you for listening and watching. Please share this episode with your friends. Uh, this is a way you can inspire other creative people, especially people who are like Tiffany, who are these multi-hyphenates, right? Who are making and singing and creating and uh, documenting. All this stuff is a... Um, it's a it's a lifelong marathon that we get to run and you can tell tiffany is putting in the work so send this to somebody who's putting in the work loving the work living the work and if you want to support us as a nonprofit, remember we are a nonprofit, a 501c3 nonprofit. all of the work that we do is funded by generosity 43 people give a, a donation every month to help us with our streaming platform with our studio space with our film festival that's coming up and you can use your phone and just text the word Brave Maker. It's one word, Brave Maker, to 44321. And you'll get a link right to your phone. So text the word Brave Maker right to your phone. And you can give today and become a monthly donor. And I, I just want to ask if you believe in the arts, like you're hearing Tiffany say, if you believe in the work that Brave Maker is doing. Some of you have been listening or watching or participating for all six years of Brave Maker's existence. Some of you have been listening to hundreds of our podcasts. We want to keep doing this. We want to keep going. We do our monthly events every month, uh, usually on the second weekend of the month. We do a film screening. We have art shows. We have live music. All this information can be found at bravemaker.com, and we would love for you to support us. Thank you to our producer, Amy Cohen, our interns, uh, Jessica Cohen, uh, who does clips and will take this video and edit it into small little bite-sized things that go on Instagram our audio editor, Barnell Amos, and our social media producer, Carrie Alley. Thank you so much again to Tiffany Marie for being here. Yes, it's awesome. Uh, we are excited for your work and all the artists that you're supporting. And hang on until after we close here because I want to chat about the potential 
for bringing you out for Juneteenth in Redwood City. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you next week. Uh, same time, Thursday afternoons. And if you have any questions about what we do, if you want to get involved with Brave Maker, you can find me at Tony at BraveMaker.com or on all the socials at Tony Gap. So, all right, Brave Stories Change the World, and you are the story. Bye, everybody. <laughs>